I, I think of a good bowl of ramen. To me, a good bowl of ramen has no beginning and has no end, to not be too mm. zen about it. I, 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 I feel like, and when I say that, I mean that you can start anywhere. You can have a bite of meat. You can have a sip of soup. You can have a, some, some, some uh, you know, a menma. You can have some noodles, whatever. And then you start eating it, and it all kind of flows together. And you don't really, it doesn't feel, and, and so I'm, I'm comparing and contrasting with a bad bowl. So when you get a bad bowl, they're clunky, they're disparate. You wonder why they thought of all those toppings and that soup mm-hmm. and that noodles, because none of them really fit together. And then when you slurp, the noodle comes up in your mouth and it's sort of dry because the, they didn't make a good broth to, and tarik and fat to blend with the noodles. So it has no flavor. And it's just this, you know, to me, a bad bowl of ramen is so soul sucking. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Way Around In. So as you can see, this video is a little bit different than the cooking videos I normally do on this channel. This is actually a video version of a podcast that we recorded with Ivan Orkin last week. So for those of you who are not familiar with Ivan Orkin, he's a pretty legendary figure in the ramen community. He first came to fame as a Westerner or a foreigner making ramen in Japan. He had this small shop called Ivan Ramen in Tokyo, and he quickly became like a rookie on the rise, a rookie to watch, and he started appearing in Japanese media, Japanese magazines, Japanese TV shows. So after many years of operating successfully in Japan, Ivan moved back to the States and opened Ivan Ramen in New York City, again to critical acclaim. And he's been on late night TV shows, he's written cookbooks, been in documentaries, magazines, he's been on Chef's Table on Netflix. He's basically been an ambassador for ramen and Japan in the United States. So a few weeks ago, a charity called Ask Chefs Anything put together a charity auction to help immigrant restaurant workers in New York City. So basically what happened was they got a bunch of celebrity chefs or well-known chefs in New York City to donate their time to do 30-minute Zoom calls with anybody who won the bid for their auction. While the auction was going on, I hit up Ivan, who was one of these chefs that donated his time, and asked him, hey, if I'm somehow able to win the bid, would you come on my podcast and maybe do maybe an hour? And to my surprise, he agreed. And so me and my buddy Ramen Lord, we went in half seas, we chipped in, and we somehow won the bid for Ivan's time. And so this is our discussion with Ivan Orkin. Mike and I had a great time talking to him, and he was just a class act, very professional, and he gave a ton of great insights into how to get better and how to make great ramen. So enjoy. Good, good. Thanks so much for doing this. Oh, my, thank you so much for being so generous, you guys. It was so nice of you, it really was. It, it's, a, it's a tough time right now, so. Uh, you know, helping, you know, it's weird when your job is to feed people and make them happy and there's so many hungry, unhappy people. Uh, yeah. Everything everything gets a little weird because it's it's just, how do you, like, I don't know, what does it all mean anymore? I mean, if there's yeah. hungry people all over the place, I don't know. It's uh, it's very unsettling. Yeah. yeah. We, we, hopefully we can kind of put this up and then get more people to donate. Are they still going to be running the charity throughout or is it kind of like a set thing or... Um, I don't know. I mean, I personally have been donating to a lot of local food banks. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's for me personally, I think it's the easiest way to sort of make sure that people are eating. I mean, to me, you know, of course, losing your home is the other thing that mm-hmm. could be horrible. But uh, if you can eat, at least, you know, you can somehow survive. So uh, uh, I, we've been trying to do a lots of different things that provide people uh, with food. All right, we'll try to fit something in there so we can kind of help people out because yeah, it's it's been rough for I can I can't even imagine for people who own restaurants right now, and every, all their staff and everything how hard it is for them. So, oh, it's bizarre. It's bizarre because there's no way to know. It's it's I've been through a lot of tough times. You know, I've been through. Uh, let me see if I can get my okay. Now I got I, got, I hit that. I'm uh, you guys are much uh, younger than I am, so you're probably much better at all of these technical things. I'm not terrible. But but I'm not great either. So I, I uh, uh, you know, sometimes I get a little fatigued on how to how no, make no. things. Work. It's going um, great. Yeah, but um, but yeah. So it's been you know weird because it, it's uh, uh, you know we're we're stuck doing delivery. But you know, I mean, when I started Ivan Ramen in New York, I refused to do delivery, and I yeah. fought very very hard. You know, I came from I came from having a little teeny shop in Tokyo and. I was in that little uh, Kodawari world. There were like mm-hmm. crazy rules for everything. And, and so I tried so hard to be, you know, like all the other dudes that were in my little world. And, you know, the idea of putting noodles in a cup and then having it sit there for hours really drove me crazy. But, 
you know, in New York, because the rents are so high and the costs are so high, it's very hard to make enough money just having people come in. And, you know, uh, uh, I, I think, you know, this, this pandemic has highlighted, you know, obviously uh, a need for delivery. Um, and I don't know about where you guys live, but I know here in New York, people really like delivery. I, I don't like delivery. I, I've maybe gotten food delivery 10 times in 56 years. I mean, I just, <laughs> I don't really like it. Mm -hmm. I learned how to cook because I wanted to eat fresh, delicious food whenever I wanted it. And, uh, and I love restaurants. So I love supporting them, but I love, I love dining out and I love talking to waiters and sommeliers and I love work or just sitting at a burger place and having a burger and watching the guy flip the burger. I and mean, that for me is my passion. Um, so I've, I've never done delivery that, that much, but, but, but it, people love it. And so I gave in after about two years <laughs> and uh, I, I started doing delivery and uh, you know, we separate the noodles, we shop them, we toss them a tiny, tiny bit of oil, we put them on the side, and then we put the broth and the garnish in another container, and you mm -hmm. combine them. Um, from the beginning, I wanted to only send raw noodles because actually, Ivan Ramen, if you bring the noodles home raw with all the garnish, and you reheat everything, and you cook the noodles uh, fresh, it's, it tastes exactly the way it does right. in a restaurant. Because, right? Because um, uh, ramen is just an, an assembly factory, really. Mm -hmm. and, you, know, you, you, you do all the prep, earlier in the day and then you just right. keep kind of reassembling everything so it's not that i'm against delivery it's actually like the ramen kits really work well it's 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 the problem with uh with having it sit around once they're cooked you know yeah, yeah. The, you can't control the quality once they make it and it's like oh hey, everybody come to dinner and their kids yeah. are playing games or something and 10 yeah. minutes later they're coming down to eat and it's everything but if you cook the noodles fresh and you dump steaming hot broth over it and mm -hmm. you reheat your chashu and your egg and you have the scallions and you put them on top it's it's i mean it's delicious it's really good yeah okay well mike and i have a bunch of questions here so we're gonna do this for our interview okay and uh we'll just kind of take turns asking these questions so mike did you want awesome. to go first you want me to go first or yeah i mean we can just you know, organically do we it. Have a, we can just kind of organically do it. I think it's interesting. You, t you know, some of the questions are about the business of ramen, which you're like the biggest expert in all of this in the United States on. And some of them are well, most about I, your process. I will just but, tell you that I have never, ever, ever claimed to be an expert in ramen, but I do claim, <laughs> I do claim to be an expert of Ivan ramen. Yeah. So, and, and what I know you, Mike, you know, I know you're really passionate about ramen. And I'm sure what you've learned is that, and what I love about ramen personally, is that no matter what fantastic shop you find that you really love, there's another shop that does it like so completely differently, or maybe the food's not quite as good as the other place, but the master is a total boot and he's funny, or he has like really crazy posters and he, and he gives out like goofy candy to your kids or whatever, like this, you know, it's like, it's what I, it's what I fell in love about ramen. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, you know, the, the whole vibe of the ramen shop and the way people do it and how it's not such an expensive business to try, to try to get into so it gives you an opportunity to try to create some kind of a unique thing that will make you stick out so of course the better your food in, in any place not just ramen the better but as we all know we've been to restaurants where the food was amazing but the service was terrible and we never went back but we've been to places where the food was pretty good but the service and the atmosphere was great we always go back mm -hmm. so it's you know it's it's i find you know ramen to be really exciting because there's just so many different varieties and different types of noodles and different types of garnish and um and there's a lot of really interesting creative people doing a fantastic job you know? yeah so th that really kind of segues nicely into what i think is the big question here overarching you've been in this game of cooking for a while we're we're kind of noobs in comparison to you though we are a little obsessive what is your relationship with ramen like now compared to what it was like when you started out you know in japan making it has it changed? Is it the same? It's a great question. And, you know, it's really apropos because at this moment. So what's happened to me is, you know, I opened Ivan Ramen in uh, June 2007. So it's almost exactly 13 years. And I conceived of the idea and started researching it and practicing uh, uh, a year before that. So it's been 14 years since this idea of running a ramen shop began. And... Uh, in the very beginning, for a chef, too, it was really exciting because I had a 10-seat restaurant. 
I walked, I would walk in my neighborhood, I would go to the meat guy, pick up my meat, bring it back, start my soup, then I'd walk to the vegetable lady, I'd get my vegetables, I'd come back, I'd put my, my tomatoes in the oven to roast all day. Maybe I'd go over to the, another place and pick up something that I was missing or whatever. And, I, and then I would cook all day, then I would clean the place and, I, and then I would serve the customers and then I would clean up and then I would do the whole thing again the next day. And it was really, really, really a dream come true in a way. It's that, that amazing thing when, as a chef, like uh, in Chicago and even in, in, in Honolulu, in New York, it's like to make enough money, it's hard to have a little tiny place where you can just sort of do that, like touch every guest, touch every vendor, you know, talk to your neighbors. I mean, it was, it was an absolute uh, amazing experience. So, you know, then I came back to New York and it's a totally different world. I mean, in, in Tokyo, everything's on a handshake. There's no lawyers, there's no contracts. It's all like beautiful and organic. And then New York, it's like you, if you forget to sign something, you know, you get sued or, you, or someone rips you off and, and you know, you, you order, you know, pork butt, but you get pork loin. And if you don't check, they don't care. And it, it, like it's, it's, it was a really different world, but I built that one up with myself and my team and, so what's happened different is that I became a business person. I, I had two shops in Tokyo, and when I opened the second one, I tried to be the same Ivan I was before, like doing everything myself. But I had become a little bit popular, and people in the restaurant wanted to talk to me, and they wanted to hang out and things like that. And then my staff was always angry at me because I'd walk off the line, and I'd start talking to guests, and then they'd be like, you know, Ivan, we need you here. We can't make the food without you. And so when I opened the next place, I realized uh, in New York that I had to be just the, the business guy. I couldn't, I couldn't like be the chef because there's no way I can be on a schedule and do all the things that are required to run a business properly. Um, but something else happened in that I kept, I started hiring chefs and they started helping me make food. Now they've all been very good cooks and, and we, we've always collaborated. I've never had everything made completely without me sort of tasting or talking or doing things. But as the, you get busier and there's more things to do, it gets harder to do everything yourself. So now, you know, fast forward, here we are during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and I've been cooking again a lot. You know, I've been making new ramen dishes. I've been, you know, making new garnishes. I've been sitting and just thinking like, like, what, what do I do next? How do I help my business get rebound? And so I'm really uh, much more in touch again with what I'm really good at. You know, I'm really good at cooking. I, I mean, I, I've become sort of this weird brand and, um, you know, I've written some books and I've gone on television. I do stuff because it's really important. You know, I, it's not really an ego thing because I don't really have a big ego about it, but, it, but, it, but it's, it's super important in 2020 to have a media presence if you want to have any success. It's just... It's just the way. It's, it's very hard to be successful without it. So I've embraced it. And, and I love people and I love feeding people. I mean, it's not fake. I mean, I really, truly enjoy watching people eat. And I like knowing that someone's day was kind of lousy and then they ate at my restaurant and when they left, they felt happy. And if I can, if I can, so my goal is to make sure every customer leaves happier than when they came in. Obviously, that doesn't happen all the time, but but I try really hard. And so to answer your question after uh, being long-winded about it is that I I think I'm getting a little more in touch with trying to uh, uh, remember why why I was successful in the first place and try to you know cook more and uh, and uh, get back into that and, and enjoy it while I can. Eventually, if I get busy again, I'll I'll have to cede control to somebody. But right now, I am the executive chef. Ivan Robin. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Did you find that delegation process difficult? Like that transition from being an individual who did everything to a business owner who really oversaw rather than sat on the line. Did you find that transition difficult? You know what? I'm really, really, really good at delegating. Like I'm a, I'm a master delegator. My wife gets angry at me because she'll say, you're delegating to me and I don't like it. And, you know, so I, you know, I, 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 I'm very good at delegating. And I think to be, a, because I've read a lot of business books. I've always been interested in business. I didn't sort of stumble into it. It's always been something that's interested me. So I've read a lot of books about it since I was a, a college kid. And, and I've always, it's always been very intriguing to me. And pretty much every book says, you know, that you have to be willing to let go and, 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 and be supported by people. Otherwise, you, you know, you fail. Because, because you just get overwhelmed. You can't do everything yourself. So I think that, you know, I, I've been pretty good at, at, at finding people that I trust and that I like. 
and I'm not afraid to some, tell someone I don't like them and I don't trust them. So I, you know, <laughs> you know it, it's so I'm able to, I've been able to mostly, I, I think, uh, delegate different things and, uh, and be happy. And, and I'm also relatively good at taking responsibility for what I do. So if, if, if I'm not happy, I, 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 mean, I, I really hate victims. And I hate when people set, act as if things happen to them and they had no control. And, you know, unless it's a, you know, a tornado and an earthquake or a pandemic, you know, I mean, we all have to take a certain amount of responsibility. And even in that case, did you, did you, you know, store extra water and food when you, you knew the hurricane was coming? Did you board up your windows? Did you have extra Tylenol, you know, flu medicine in your closet? You knew, you know, I mean, there's, you can always be responsible, I think, uh, for for your life, and I and I've I've found that I'm much happier when I take responsibility for things. Sure, we only we all have our sphere of control, and that's all we can really manage anyway. So absolutely, complaining about stuff it really doesn't help anything. Yeah. So you talked about this in the beginning of the call about you're just an expert in Ivan ramen. Could you explain what Ivan ramen is? Like, what is your style of ramen? Well, you know, it's funny because I, so I've, you know, uh, I'm, I started going to Japan. I started, I fell in love with, with Japanese food in, in when I was 15. I, I worked at a sushi bar slash kind of Japanese restaurant and uh, really fell, fell in love hard for it. And uh, ultimately, and I studied Japanese in college and I moved to Japan. And, um, um, and when and I lived in Japan for a couple of years and I came back to the States and I lived again in, in America for 13 years. And you could eat almost anything but the Japanese food, but you couldn't eat ramen. There was no ramen. It didn't exist. And a couple of shops did some kind of weird watery version that was terrible. <laughs> and so it was a thing that I kept dreaming about. Like someday I'm going to, when I get back to Japan, I can't wait to eat ramen. So fast forward to 2003 when, when I returned and had no plan. I, it was still, you know, three years away from ever coming up with this idea about a ramen shop. But what did happen was it was right in the in the beginning of the ramen boom and as you know like you know people say ramen boom ramen's always been popular so they're not really mm -hmm. it's, it's you know it's, it's it was sort of a blue collar food a guy food a truck driver food it was never like you know pretty pretty girls in designer outfits didn't eat ramen you didn't take your mom and your grandma to go grab a bowl you know it wasn't not everybody ate it um but all of a sudden it was starting to get a lot of exposure as we spoke earlier in this call you know there was all these uh um you know a lot of shops have a lot of charisma and a lot of a lot of fun things about them and so people were starting to notice and that's right when i kind of landed back in japan so and i and i had this this un unbelievable craving for ramen and so i just started eating ramen like every chance i got and you know i'm not a ramen geek like some of the dudes on the internet you know i don't i've never eaten you know, a, a thousand bowls, let alone even 300 bowls. I mean, I, I, it's just not my thing because I love food. I, I, you know, I love dining. I love eating out. And I like eating. I like having a glass of wine and anchovies on toast as much as I like having a good python. You know, I, I just enjoy food. And ramen is one of my favorites. Um, mm -hmm. But at the time, man, I was just, we were just crushing bowls and I would take my wife and the kids and we would eat all the time. And then my wife had a job and I was sort of her helper at the time because I didn't have a job and, and so we would drive around and this is before the uh, before the, the whole internet thing was happening we had the, what, what they called the ramen navi I don't know if you guys ever heard of that so it was when you had the flip phones and mm -hmm. and you'd go to this ramen navi and it would tell you like where the shops are so you would punch in you know set the guy uh, you know whatever Shimo Kitazawa and it would pop up the shops and then you know we would drive around until we found a shop we'd find a Hyakuen parking and then we'd, we'd run and, and eat, a, eat a bowl of ramen. And, uh, and, and it, was just, it became really, really interesting. So I started to, uh, this is once again, a very long answer to what makes Ivan ramen special, but, uh, or, or different or anything. But, but it was, so I started eating all this, this ramen and I discovered I was in my mid forties at this time. And I couldn't really eat that much tonkotsu ramen. Like we would go to these shops and we would eat a bowl of tonkotsu and I would be driving and I would be getting really sleepy or I'd have to like run and find a bathroom or I'd yeah, you really, pass out. <laughs> yeah. Like pass out or I'd be super bloated and we'd have a bowl yeah. at 1130 in the morning and I wouldn't eat until the next day. And so I just, saw, I, you know, so I was a little like worried because a lot of the shops were heavy. And then one day I found this shop that did a double soup, like the kind mm -hmm. I make. Um, and the shop was called, 
I will tell you later. I can't remember, but and he's gone. He died. But anyway, it was a, it was this guy did this. He did a dashi and a chicken broth with thin, tasty noodles that had a real good bite to them. And I ate it, and I was like, "Wow, this is this is good." And I could eat this every day. So I got really excited about this idea of ramen that you could eat every day, a ramen that wouldn't put my customers into a coma. Because remember, I'm sort of a, a French trained chef. And my, my idea about feeding people is that they feel good when they leave. And, mm -hmm. and if they feel bad, it's because they decided to drink more wine than they should have, or they decided to have a lot of food and then they overate. But, if, but I think in a restaurant, when you feed someone a normal amount of food, people should feel at least pretty good. And, and so that was sort of my, that's sort of the, in, in a way, that's the unofficial theme of Ivan Ramen, making food that's light enough and clean enough and doesn't have too much crap in it that it, that'll dra drag you down, you know? And, and so, you know, I do a, a dashi that has uh, several kinds of fushi in it, you know, that's uh, katsuo and uh, udume. And uh, um, I think I have, a, I have a little bit of, um, uh, uh, I, Ika in there, some dried squid and, uh, and, and some anchovy in there and, uh, and makombu, like everybody uses makombu. And then I blend that with, with just a simple whole chicken broth. Mm -hmm. um, that's the main Ivan Ramen broth. I've done lots of broths over the years. You know, I did that Ivan Ramen Plus. I did a, a pork and chicken broth uh, uh, that, that, and I did a shio version. I, I've done many, many maze men's over the year. I'm, Big, I'm a big Mazenen fan, so I've, uh, but all of them were generally, you know, relatively simple. And, you know, and if I eat a bowl and I feel like I want to puke, then it doesn't go on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's such an interesting point, right? Like this idea of like feeling good after eating ramen, especially because it's often perceived as this gut bomb, this tonko to the super creamy pass out food. At least in America here, that's in kind of America like for sure. Perception. Which I think over of... the whole world, I think I think it's the same reason why a steak with a really rich demi glace and fried potatoes and cream spinach or something a variation of that anywhere in the world or a schnitzel. I mean, it's always going to be popular. We all love that stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, I still like that stuff, and occasionally I eat it. I just don't, you know. And, and you know what? I, and, I, and, I, and I make no promises. You know, maybe I do a python that's pretty rich. I think. Um, and maybe someday I'll do a tonkatsu, you know, I mean, people want me to, um, but it's, it's, but I think at the, at the end of the day, I do, I just feel like, I feel like you can make, you can, you can craft a bowl of ramen that hits all those points you want that don't, that, but doesn't like make you feel crappy. I really do. I mean, I've done it. So, I mean, I, it's, it's totally doable. And, uh, even you can pull off, I think you can pull off a judo style if you're, if you're, if you're careful. And, you know, because what are the different components of a gyro style, right? It's not just the crazy, like, I mean, that broth is, it's, it's worse than a gut bomb. It's, it's, a, it's a death wish. You know, I, I had my first gyro and, you know, I was, I was sick for two days and, and, and it was a good bowl. It was not, it was a real, the guy who made it, it was, it was a place out in, um, uh, uh, in um, Hachioji. Okay, that's supposed to be a good one, actually. It's, that's, no, no, that's it's, one it's a great one. So the, the one out in Hachioji, the owner and I were friends. He was really, really nice. He made all the noodles from scratch and they were like chewy and delicious. And no, I mean, so I'm just trying to say like, I, I'm, I'm not actually criticizing it. It, it was such yeah. a, it was such a good bowl. And I had the, the, I had the Pucci bowl. So it was like this tiny little bowl and it was so delicious, but I had the worst nightmares I've ever had in my life <laughs> before or since. And I was, and I was, and I was really, really sick from it. And so yeah. I just realized my maybe, and, and I think part of it has to do with my age. I really do. I think, I think when you're in your twenties, you can eat almost any kind of fat laden, crazy thing. I mean, I mean, I worked at Wendy's in high school and I used to eat, you know, three double cheeseburgers, you know, per shift. So, I mean, you can, it, it's, I just think, you know, you get to be to your mid forties, you know, you guys, we can check back on it in a couple of years, you'll tell me, but, but it's, uh, it gets harder to eat all that heavy stuff. Um, but that place, if, I don't know if he's still open, but it's, if you ever, if you're ever I think there. the Hachioji location is still open, yeah. I don't know if it's the same chef, but I've heard that's, you know, these Jiro guys, they all rank all the different shops of like, which is the best ones. And right. I think that one ranks pretty highly. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. So that kind of mentality though, of like, still influences your style, if you will. Right? Sure. Like you still have a style 
of cooking, because every right. chef, we, one of the themes of ramen that we've always discussed is that every chef kind of imbues their style into it. Your right. style is, how would you describe it? Feel good cooking, cooking that makes you feel good? Uh, I would describe my style as harmonious. Harmonious. My, my, my goal is that I, I, used to, I, I think of a good bowl of ramen. To me, a good bowl of ramen has no beginning and has no end, to not be too mm. zen about it. I, 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 I feel like, and when I say that, I mean that you can start anywhere. You can have a bite of meat. You can have a sip of soup. You can have a, some, some, some uh, you know, uh, menma. You can have some noodles, whatever. And then you start eating it, and it all kind of flows together. And you don't really, it doesn't feel, and, and so I'm, I'm comparing and contrasting with a bad bowl. So when you get a bad bowl, they're clunky, they're disparate. You wonder why they thought of all those toppings and that soup mm -hmm. and that noodles, because none of them really fit together. And then when you slurp, the noodle comes up in your mouth and it's sort of dry because the, they didn't make a good broth to, and tarik and fat to blend with the noodles. So it has no flavor. And it's just this, you know, to me, a bad bowl of ramen is so soul sucking because it, because it, it's, because it, a good bowl is just like this whole thing. And you know, you guys, I mean, you guys, you know, I'm sure you eat like I eat, right? You know, you, you know, I, I don't, I don't get a bowl and chat and shit. I get a bowl and, and that's like my, you know, everything I get blinders on and my head goes down and I pretty much eat until the bowl is empty. And then I look up and I go back to who I was talking to. But I don't really you think about it outside of the restaurant. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a big chatter when I eat ramen, you know, I don't, yeah. it's just the hardest thing making ramen for Americans is that I feel bad for them. I mean, this is America. So it's, you know, in Japan, I was a real dick. I mean, if someone, if I gave someone a bowl of ramen and they didn't eat it, I, 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 I threw, I threw 10 bucks on the table and I said, you know, get out. I said, you wow. know, you eat, you eat. Well, now this is back in the day. This is, things have changed. I mean, I know it's only 13 years, 10, 12 years, whatever. Uh, but, but 13 years since I started. But it, it was really different. It was much more of a kind of a frontier land cowboy thing. You know, the, I went to my first um, uh, uh, um, Bonenkai, which is, you know, the year end uh, drinking party that companies do and people do all over Japan the last, the last two and a half months of the year. And so there was a Bonenkai for all the ramen shops. And I was so incredibly humbled to be invited because I was invited with all like the dudes, like the really famous guys. And back, back when Sakata-san from uh, 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 Ensai, and he and I opened our shops about the same time. So he was like a rookie, I was a rookie. But then, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, um, uh, um, Shimazaki-san from Rock and Roll 69 was there. Legendary. And, and yeah, and uh, um, uh, Jirai again, uh, um, uh, uh, Koitani Sansa. Koitani San and 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 uh, all those guys. And they were all sitting up like an uh, up like, like <laughs> the upper <laughs> level like of Izakaya. <laughs> and they're all sort of laughing at us because we're all like, you know, all excited and shit. But these guys have been doing it for a long time. And uh, but anyway, my point was that they were all sort of a lot of them were sort of a ragtag bunch, you know. They they weren't clean shaven, they were wearing like torn jeans, they were like wearing go fuck yourself t shirts, and they were like, you know, it was just like and, and for people that don't know Japan, you know, I mean, Japan's a pretty buttoned up place. It really is. And, and, you know, restaurants in Japan, you know, they all kind of do things a certain way. And, you know, what I think what also really appealed to me about ramen, it, it wasn't really the reason I opened the shop. I mean, I, you know, I was really, really, like I said, just so into eating ramen that the idea, and, and, then, my, and then I was getting bored. My wife was working, I was hanging. And she was like, you know, you're starting to get a little irritable and you're, you're bored and you need a project. So we, we started talking about what, what we should do. And, you know, she brought up ramen and it was a long conversation that lasted, you know, six months. But we ultimately decided on it. And one of the things that I found very appealing about ramen was there are no rules. You know, you walk into a sushi bar in Tokyo and you look exactly like you watch the guy how is he holding the knife did he pre-cut the fish how does he pile it is it wrapped in cloth is it not like is his is his, is his jacket clean does he like there's just like a thousand things and, and they have to be doing everything a certain way otherwise you know a lot of people are like oh yeah this place isn't legit let's go whereas ramen is like the absolute opposite it's like Oh, ramen is like punk crazy. rock, right? That's it's what like, it is. yeah, ramen's like punk rock, and the guy's got like, you know, the sex pistols cranking, and he's got a fucking dried out bone hanging over the door, and he's, you know, whatever, and and uh, and it's it's all cool. 
And that's what people fall in love about the shop. They love that about the shop. And so I figured, well, here I am this, I mean, I'm not stupid. I knew that opening a restaurant in Japan, so I'm already a pretty trained chef and I know how to cook. But, you know, if you said to a Japanese person, at least if you asked a Japanese person 14 years ago, hey, tell me about American food, they'd say uh, burgers and shakes, right? Fries, pizza. And, you know, you'd be like, well, I mean, yeah, those are things that are popular. But, you know, real American cuisine is really just a riff on French, German, Spanish. You know, you could open in Seattle and you write where you have cedar planked salmon and you, you take huckleberries and you, you make a, a you make some make a sauce with it. And then you take, you know, pine things and whatever. There's just, mm. it's, you know, but you're still using Western technique. You're still doing French style or maybe you're doing a German style or whatever. But an American understands that's what you're doing. But I was very scared to try to open that type of restaurant because I thought that people would be like, what is this? And you'd be you're yeah. like this American guy, you know? And so believe it or not, I thought that ramen was like a much better idea because I figured, well, hey, I mean, I'm a serious cook. I decided to make my own noodles from scratch. I like my, my kitchen was super spotless, you know, and, you know, and I really cared. And, you know, Japanese people like people that care. And, and, and you know, I I'd spent many years. I mean, at the end of the day, Ivan Ramen, if you at the real theme of Ivan Ramen, more than anything else, is that I fucking love Japan. I'm sometimes super disappointed that people don't get it at all. And even all these years later, and they'll just be like, oh, I hear it's really expensive there. I'm like, yeah, in like 1986. I mean, what are you talking about? You know, and they're like, oh, I hear it's, you know, it's so crowded, you can never move. And I'm like, well, yeah, in some places, but not every place. And, and you know, it's really expensive to go there. And I'm like, well, the plane takes expensive, but then it's actually really reasonable. And, and you know, and, and it, it's just... It's just, I feel like, you know, a lot of people still think Japanese people walk around in getta and kimono and they're, you know, and, and it, it just, and so for me, you know, ramen, Ivan ramen is also my, just my opportunity to try to expose people to a culture that I really love and, and that I think mm -hmm. is very special. And, um, you know, it's, and, and it happens, you know, ramen's been a real cool way to get people to give J Japan a chance. And all of a sudden you have people saying, I got to go to Tokyo to try ramen. And then, of course, once they get there, they don't only eat ramen. They try a lot of other things, and they and they visit temples, but they also go to cool department stores, and they also go to cool museum exhibits, and and then they and then they and then everybody wants to go back because they're like, wait a second, this is like the greatest place in the world. And I'm like, I see, I told you, it's the greatest place. Yeah. It's so awesome. So I mean, I've I've taken the opportunity with this business to try to. Um, I'm always. I'm always stumping for, you know, for, for Japan and always trying to get people to give it a second look and, and to appreciate it. And, uh, and, and it's happening, right? I mean, up until this terrible thing that happened, I mean, you know, Japan, Kyoto and Tokyo were like in the top five most visited places in the world. So it's, it's great. It's really, it's good. And, and uh, um, Japan's neat. It really is. Do you miss living in Japan? having kind of gone back and forth between the two countries frequently? Um, well, I mean, we were, we had tickets. We were supposed to, we were leaving, uh, uh, we were supposed to go March 28th to April 12th. Um, I mean, I've been going pretty much three to, three or four times a year. Um, I, tr I try, I mean, I, you know, uh, I just sort of decided that it's really important for me to go. I, when I go, I just get, I get so energized for everything. I just, I mean, like I said, I'm sort of weird. I mean, I've got, I've crossed over to the point where when I'm in Japan, I mean, I've, I've never thought of myself as Japanese because I'm just not. I'm a, I'm a fast talking, loud mouth New Yorker and I'm never going to change. And I don't try to be Japanese, but there's a lot of things about Japan that I, I deeply respect and appreciate. And when I go to Japan, I act like a Japanese person in that respect. I don't think I'm Japanese or anything, but I just, I flow into it right away. You know, I'm, I'm much more polite. I'm much more careful about my movement and my behavior. I'm much more aware of what I do. And I, I'm always looking at everybody around me and I'm participating the way everybody is expected to participate. And it's, it's very easy for me to flow into that. And then when I get off the plane in New York, boom, I'm right back in. I get in the cab and I'm like, what, what, what the fuck are you taking, taking the Van White for, man? You know, no, no. No, 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 I make a lot, you know, and I'm right back into the whole thing. Um, so I miss it, but you know, America's, it's funny. I mean, I, I speak Japanese pretty well. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I hate the fluent word because I don't know, I don't think I'm fluent. I mean, I can't really talk about physics or about <laughs> complex 
politics or yes. but but I can but I can speak all day and all night for weeks and months and never utter English either. And so I, I speak Japanese, but but English is my first language. Um, I'm a big I'm a big reader. Um, uh, uh, I, I find that when I'm in America, like I'm just soaking in like language and both written and spoken. Like it's just because I'm, I'm just that it's me. Like I'm just this. I'm always reading and I'm always talking and I'm always listening. And so in English, I'm so highly functioning. And in Japanese, it's just I can I've noticed since I moved back, it's just, it's just a lower level. And mm-hmm. so you know, in that respect. Um, I think America's great. I mean, my fantasy is to is to have a place there and a place here. And once the kids, I have one more. I have one more kid at home. Uh, uh, and once he's done with high school or college or whatever, then I hope we'll just be able to say, "Hey, let's go to Tokyo for a couple months, and we'll come back when we're done." And we'll get out, and that's my that's sort of my fantasy. Um, and right now, I've just been sort of. And luckily, my business is related to Japan, so. It's not a big stretch to say I need to go to Japan. You know, no one really questions me. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and I do. I almost always come back with like new recipe ideas. I almost always come back with like new feelings about something we could do in the restaurant or something I could talk about or something I could write about. And so it's uh, it's uh, it really works for me. So I, I guess I know in my heart that I'll eventually either live there again or spend a lot more time. Mm-hmm. We have very good friends, very good family. You know, we have a lot of a lot of roots there now. And you know, my wife is from Japan. My uh, all my kids speak Japanese, and my my eleven year old is like, I don't know if I'll ever be as fluent as he is, but uh, you know. So they're all they're all just sort of. I've been very I've been relatively successful in having a, bi- a bilingual bicultural home, which is uh, very challenging. It's really 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 hard because kids don't really want to be forced into that but uh but we've managed to kind of pull it off so it's nice you know and, and i you know my wife married a, an american but i'm an american who probably knows more japanese history than she does and i probably and I, and I and i can cook anything she wants to eat from home and so we have this really kind of groovy thing going on because we're we just enjoy each other's culture and each other's cuisine and you know, each other's language. And, and so, I mean, I, I don't think, I think, you know, I've kind of hit that sweet spot. Mm-hmm. That's awesome, man. That's really cool. Like, yeah, for the, as far as like language things, I've heard it being described before as your first language is like playing guitar. And then your second language is like playing guitar with gloves on. It's like, it never quite feels the same. It feels always yeah. kind of like a little awkward. I, I understand what you mean. Cause I taught myself Japanese too. And it's been rough to try to get to the level of, yeah, and, it, I, and I, I also majored in Japanese in college, and it's just like you never quite feel there. But yeah. no, it's it's hard, man. It's hard. I mean, I, I think I think the good thing about studying Japanese in college, I, I studied Japanese in college too, and, and uh, the one thing that was really good about it, and I, I'm a lousy student. I don't love school. I love learning. I love. I, I'm always learning, and I and I love learning, but I never really love school. I have a lot of trouble with. Even at 50, almost 57, I, I still have a lot of trouble with authority and uh, anybody telling me what to do. But, uh, but, I'm, but I, I find that um, I learned all my grammar in, in college. Like I just, I, for whatever reason, I don't know why, but my grammar and, my, and all my, my tenses and all that stuff, I almost mastered. And so I've, I've been, I'm able to sort of always plug shit in and like communicate pretty well. Um, but my reading sucks. Um, obviously, reading reading on the internet is kind of easier, and, and typing, especially. Like I can I can write in Japanese because of all the you know it's it's easy to choose all the things. And you know, in college, I, I was I knew two thousand kanji in college, but I, I forgot a lot of them. And uh, it's uh, you know I don't know it's on my bucket list to someday finally kick myself in the ass and you know read the newspaper or a novel and uh, um, you know. Hopefully I have some more time. Cool, man. All right. So a lot of people that listen to this podcast, they're like home cooks or people trying to get better at making ramen. So I want to talk a little bit about concepts of making ramen uh, for just a little bit and get your insight on these things. What are some of the main characteristics of a, well, you kind of talked about this, but of a good bowl of ramen to you. But as far as like when you're making it, what should people be focusing on when they're trying to make ramen? Um. Well, you know, I think there's sort of two ways to look at it. Like, I, I, I try to be, uh, like I said, I really, I really try to be humble about this kind of thing. And I, and I, I, because I think that, 
I think that it's better to cook than to not cook. So you can start off there rather than telling someone, well, if you don't do the ramen this way, then you might as well just fucking quit because it's not right. <laughs> you know, which is, which you could say, I mean, Mike, right. You could totally like, you can totally geek out about making ramen, right? And be like, oh, well, it has to be this, it has to be that. But then sometimes you'll, someone will say, I worked all day on this and it was so fun and, I, and, and everybody loved it and I was so happy. And I might look at the ball go, oh, wow, geez. <laughs> what, what is that that you've just made? But, but I would never say that because it's so incredibly exciting that that person spent all that energy trying to make a bowl of ramen. So, having, so, so I, I guess to start off with, Ramen for some people can just be a tasty soup with noodles and some fun, tasty toppings. And that could be ramen for someone. And, and I think there's nothing wrong with that, quite frankly. Um, I think once that person gets over that hump of putting all those ingredients into a bowl and, and they go, wow, this was actually fun. I like this. Then, then you can sort of introduce the idea of, well, hey, when you slurp the noodles, how was it for you? Did the noodles, like, did like the flavor stay in your mouth or were the noodles not tasty or not? Because to me, that's the, that to me is the most important thing. The most horrible thing for me is eating, eating noodles that have no flavor. It, it bums me out because they just, they don't, because the flavor doesn't stick on them. And, and it's, it's sort of like, what's the whole point of it anyway? And uh, so I think that's really important. And I go to ramen shops sometimes where, I mean, the, you know, I, I think it's part of why I decided to make my own noodles because I, I really wanted to control both things. And mm -hmm. I think nowadays in Tokyo, you can choose, they'll make your recipe or they'll work with you. But when I started, they wouldn't. They would say, here's the five noodles we make. Choose one. And that was like sort of like, well, fuck that. Why do I have to use your noodles? And, you know, I mean, you going to work with me? No. I mean, so, um, you know, I, maybe I'll try to make my own. Um, but I think that people should, you know, there, there's a lot, there's, you know, when I started, there was zero in writing. The stuff in Japanese were all lies and there was nothing in English. So there was, it was, it was really hard. So the good news is there's all these great books. You know, I wrote a book, you know, the, uh, the fella from, um, uh, Hugh Amano wrote a book. It's super fun. Sarah Gavigan wrote a book, you know, Brian McDuxton wrote a book. There's, you know, there's all these books out there and there's, and then there's tons of, I'm sure you guys post all kinds of stuff. So there's, there's lots of information to try to figure out how to get, you know, a, a good bowl of ramen. But, you know, I usually, I've always, even now, I usually start with one or the other. I start with the noodle or I start with the broth. I always start with one or the other. You know, I, I make a noodle. I, I fall in love with the noodle. I say, this noodle's fucking badass. I love this noodle. Then I have to build a bowl of ramen from that noodle, you know? And then you just have to keep going, but you stick with the noodle. No matter how many bad bowls you make, you just keep going with that noodle because you've decided well, that's that's the noodle you want to work with. Or, you know, you go the other way and you make a broth and, you know, that you really, really like. And you want to stick with that broth and then you build from the broth. I kind of feel like you have to build from one or the other. Now, of course, if you're buying noodles yourself from some place and that's all you can get, then I guess you have to go from the noodles. And that's where it starts getting complex for a home person who's not like one of us. You know, we all like, oh, my God, I got to keep going until it's right. And not everybody has that stamina to because because it can be a really long you know, I've been working on into some new soups and boy, I made one the other day. It was just terrible. <laughs> and it really bummed me out. And I was just like, man, you know, I thought I was good, but I always have to remind myself, you know, ramen's funny. It's, you know, once you've had a saute steak, right? It's, you almost never fuck it up. It's just, yeah. it's pretty easy, yeah. you know? And, but, but ramen, it's just, I've never been able to take one bowl and then make another one and have it be good right away. It's just always like, it's a learning curve. Once again, this idea of, because it's all these different textures that you're trying to marry together. And so it's really hard, you know, the, the texture of the noodle. And then, and then you know, the, what makes the noodle, you know, stick to the tare or vice versa. So that's like this whole crazy question you get absorbed in. And it can be a really, and, 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 and because it takes so much time, it can be very disheartening to, to expend this amazing amount mm -hmm. of time and then have it be like, well, that was shit. And, you know, and, and, it's, and it's, it takes the wind out of you. So, you know, I guess what I'd love to tell people that are interested in ramen is to be easy on themselves and just have fun. You know, I mean, I, I think making your own noodles is cool. I put a recipe for it in my book and, you know, I think they really work. Um, I think making your own noodles is very satisfying. And I kind of feel like if you're going to go to all the effort 
of making a tare and making, you know, and making a rom, you know, uh, 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 making some kind of uh, fat and making a broth and all that stuff and chashu, then why not spend the extra hour and make noodles? You know, it, it's, and, and if you do it two or three times, you'll start to really figure out what it is that you like, I think, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got your noodle recipe in this book here. <laughs> the Japanese one. The Japanese one. Oh, that, that's like, oh my God. That, man, I was so proud of that. You know, I mean, you have to remember, man. I mean, it, it, people were really nice to me. They really were. I mean, I, I just, you know, it, it was, uh, it was, I mean, I, I'm weird. I, I, I generally don't get scared just because I think I'm a little crazy or stupid or I don't know. I just kind of, you know, I opened a shop in Japan because I wanted to. I didn't really, I wasn't really scared of it because I felt like I had as much a right to open a ramen shop as anybody else. You know, my wife and my kids are Japanese. I I speak Japanese. I follow the customs. I pay taxes. I I take the garbage out the right way. I do everything I'm supposed to do. So why shouldn't I open a ramen shop? But having said that, to get, you know, acknowledged or have someone put that magazine, I mean, right? I mean, that magazine is badass. And it's, it's beautiful. And so, you know, having, a, having, having them put me in there was like incredible, you know, or, and, and there, so there were a lot of really cool things that I was able to do when I was there that made me really happy. You know, it's, just, it's, it's different here, you know, it's a, it's a different, you know, the, commu- the ramen community in Japan is really interesting. You know, it's changed a lot. When, back when I started, it was much, much smaller and it was a lot more organic. I mean, nowadays it's a lot more controlled by the ramen magazines. And the ramen magazines kind of decide, oh, this year is the year of potage. And it's like, fuck, I mean, why? You fucking numb nut. You don't know anything about ramen and you're deciding that we're all going to make potage now. And it's, it's a, it always find it a little irritating because it's, you know, and not, not that some of the ramen guys are, so the, the magazine guys really do know their shit. They're great guys. But, but it's just sort of like, you know, having... I mean, obviously it happens here in the, in the States too, right? You know, the James Beard Foundation, or you have the, you know, Bon Appetit or whatever. But, but it's just, the ramen, is, it's, it's, it, I feel like the magazines and the TV shows kind of, kind of are controlling the, the mm. course of ramen these days more than it used to. It used to be a lot more everybody kind of getting together at these drinking parties and they would all kind of shoot the shit and talk about stuff. And, you know, you look at that at, uh, at uh, Koitani-san from Jirai again, I mean, you know, originally years ago, he had a tiny, you know, 10 seat shop off, uh, in, in, off uh, outside of Shinjuku, off this little tiny street. And, you know, he was, and he was doing a much different style then, you know, he was doing like that, that uh, Shimazaki-san style was similar, you know, it was a very clean show you, you know, it, show you, yeah. Um, yeah and, and it was a revelation by the way, you know, I mean, the stuff that he was making back then, and the stuff that I tried to make, I mean, I still, you know, to me, you know, Shimazaki-san's Shio Ramen is like, forget about it, it's just the best, still is. I mean, he's, he's become a very good friend of mine. I haven't seen him lately, but, you know, I used to hang out with him a lot and go drinking. And he's, a, he's completely insane, but in a really good way. <laughs> and uh, uh, he's, a, he's a really good guy. And, and just, you know, I used to go out to his machita shop. And, you know, you really, they, you know, you weren't allowed to talk. I went to, I went, to, I don't know if you know Sano-san. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the ramen demon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I went to his original shop, uh, you know, in, in 2000, and boy, it was good. It was really good, you know. And uh, he was a really interesting guy. And uh, you know, to me, I like. I think my palate, you know. And if I were to criticize my own ramen, I'd say that I, I tend to try to refine my ramen too much. I'm, I'm not a. Mm. I'm not a junk food guy. I, I really don't like it. I don't eat it. I mean, I, I, you know, I've been to McDonald's, McDonald's probably five times since, since I was, you know, in high school. And, and I don't, I just don't like, I don't like, I don't like processed food at all either. And I think, I think in a way the best ramen has a really good junky component to it that I, I have difficulty understanding sometimes because I don't like it. Um, but I know it's important and I, and I know that when I eat it at someone else's place, I like it. I just, as a cook, sometimes I, 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 I tend to over refine. I, I, I polish all the edges off of things and I make them super clean, which is fine. I mean, I don't know, you know, when, when I opened Ivan Ramen and my ramen got some nice things said about it, a lot of people said it was, you know, it was, it was too light and it was too clean. And now the ramen that's popular and that's getting Michelin stars is five times lighter than mine. And some ramen shops, they're just, like, just fucking dashing with a couple of yeah. dips of yeah. oil on top, which is fine, by the way. Once again, like I said, I mean, I'm in love with this whole notion that, you know, if, if someone's serious and they, and they make a good shop, that it's okay. I mean, I love that, you know. And, and uh, have, you been to, have you been to the, uh, the new, the new uh, uh, 
Tambo. Have you been to Tambo in Kichijoji? That's a Jiraigen uh, guy. Um, mm. His is super, super light and clean. I haven't been to the Michelin place because I refuse to spend yeah, five Yeah, there's hours. a bunch of them now. There's like three. It's pretty wild. Really? Really? Yeah. I was friends with um, uh, Chabuya, uh, Mor- uh, Morizumi-san. He was the mm-hmm. first guy to ever get a, a, a Michelin star, but it was in Hong Kong, not in Tokyo. Mm. And his ramen was really good. And the shop, I don't know if you know this, but you know, you know Menya Shono? Yeah. yeah. So you know his shop in, uh, in um, not, not Gakuge Daigaku, it's, uh, anyway, it's the, it's the one where he grinds all his own wheat and he makes his own noodles. And that was Morizumi-san's shop years ago. Oh, really? I think oh, wow. that's the one that I, I, there was one shop I went to my most recent trip to Japan. That was the one where they grind it. I think it's, I think it's just Menya Shono. Yeah, and, I think it's Menya Shono or Menya Labo. Or and they do this it. crazy bowl that's got like a rim on the outside with like a scallop that's cured. Yeah, yeah. Like scar and like charred uh, scallion and stuff and yeah, Arga yep. and it's just like, what is this crazy thing? It's, it's so a nice. crazy thing. It's a crazy thing. It's it was a- ramen. It was definitely ramen. Like there's no question. Yeah, this is another level. That guy's on another level. He's he's. I've hung out with him a lot. He's just you know. I mean, we did a we did a pop up with him and and uh, in Minnesota, and he decided mm-hmm. to do a vegetarian ramen. But it, but it was like, and we served like 500 people, and his ramen had like I don't know, I'm not, I'm not joking, like 18 components, and it was just like I was like, man, I mean, why are you doing this to yourself? Like you know, <laughs> and you know, I mean, it was just he had like one little drips of this and slices of that, and it was just, I mean, it was delicious, but it was it was insane. Do you feel like that uh, is part of just because your mentality is about refining and kind of pulling out and that's like your style of cooking or? I think it's my palate. From? Yeah. I think it's my palate. I think I tend to like really bright, clean flavors a lot. And, 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 and I, and, and, you know, the, the really thick, rich, I mean, I like rich and you know, I, I do have rich stuff and like, you know, I have that, I have the maze men with, you know, bacon fat and bacon and all kinds of crazy shit. And, and it's, it's certainly rich. I just think that I, I like, tend to like uh, the, the cleaner and, and more, more sort of succinct flavors uh, tend to be what I like. And, uh, and I, I've always kind of felt that my job as a chef, and I think all chefs' jobs, you know, the, the, the day you try to start cooking for what your customer says they want specifically is the day you're finished. Because you can't, because everybody has, you know, I mean, obviously if you put something on the menu and, and then nobody really likes it and nobody orders it and every week you sell five and, you know, at some point you have to accept that it's not popular and you don't sell it or you, or you just do it because you want to, but you have to accept that people don't like it. But, you know, you can't, you know, you have to cook from your palate. You have to like, you know, and then your job, in my opinion, I mean, we, we cooks, we're salespeople. That's what we are. We make food and then we convince people to like it. And we do it in many different ways. We make the food really delicious, but maybe we choose beautiful bowls and nice chopsticks. Maybe we play some great music. Maybe you hang up some cool posters. You're, you're smiling, you're friendly, whatever you do. And our, it's our job to say, hey, you got to trust me, man. This is, maybe normally you like tonkotsu, but I'm telling you, this one's really good, and, you know, and, and convince them. And I've always felt that that's my job is to convince people, to give it a try. Mm-hmm. You know, if they don't like it, I don't tell people, you know, I've never told someone who says, hey, you know what, I, haven't, I don't really love your ramen. That to me is so super legit. I mean, it's disappointing. I wish everybody would love my food. But, but you know, I can't possibly satisfy every person because we have different palates or maybe when they were eating it, they had a cold or they were angry or, they, or the, the, there was a, a song playing on the radio that they hated. I don't know why people wouldn't like the food. You know, I only, when someone tells me my food sucks, then I'm like, well, man, you're just, you're a dick then. Because, I mean, what do you need to tell me my food sucks? If you don't like it, shut the fuck up and, and go eat somewhere else. I mean, I don't, I, you know, what, what, you want to fight? I mean, <laughs> you want me, you know. But, uh, but it's, it's, we're never going to make everybody happy and we're never going to make the exact. And, you know, if everybody, you know, if everybody comes into your shop and they keep saying, boy, I just wish you would make a real rich thick one, yeah, maybe you try it. You make a real rich thick one too. But it's, it's I still think it's really important to try to, stick to your guns, you know, find what it is that you love to cook and then get, get everybody to get excited about what you're making and convince them. And then sometimes you'll, you'll ask people later and you'll realize, wow, you know, that, that garnish really didn't work. 
I think I'll change that garnish or maybe I'll add something crunchy or, you know, sometimes people give really good feedback that you don't really notice, you know, they'll say, wow, if, if, if only there was this, it would be perfect. And, and then, you know, then you're like, oh, oh, wow, yeah, that's actually, that sounds right. You know, maybe I'll think about that. So, you know, you, you, you know, I, I really, I try, I try to, I try to keep the, the, uh, you know, the notion of, uh, you know, uh, staying humble, you know, and I always tell this funny story, you know, I'll come home sometimes from some event and I'll have fans and people will say very nice things to me and I'll come home and I'll say to my wife, you know, I talked to this guy and he said, I'm the greatest person. My food's the best in the world. i this and that. And she'll go, and you believed him. She's like, just, she's like, you know what? She goes, just fucking stop it. You know, she's like, you know, get back to work, get off your high horse, you know? And then she's right. It's, it's, it's very easy to, to, to get excited when people say nice things and it's, it's really easy to get excited and, you know, really believe it. And of course you should always feel pride in what you do. And, 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 and I mean, I have a very, I have a very healthy attitude about myself, but I also try to stay humble and because as soon as you don't, then you're just like, Oh, I guess I'm done. You know, and you meet successful people sometimes who say, well, they're, they're kind of done. And you're like, well, if you're done, then like, I don't know, what are you going to do? I mean, you got to keep, you know, I think my ramen can keep getting better. I think I can make improvements. You know, I, I keep working on new noodle recipes. And I, I recently, you know, I decided I, I decided that I, you know, I, I wasn't that happy with a lot of this game and I was trying around town. So I decided to develop my own game. And I, you know, and I, I did a new noodle and it's like a, it's like a, it's like a number 10. And it's oh, like wow. super thick, yeah. super thick, super chewy, really fun. It's really, you know, the one thing that I love about Skamen and that I, I wish people would understand is I mean, to me, the most fun thing about Skamen is chewing noodles. You know, when you eat a bowl of ramen, the texture starts to change really fast. So your that texture goes away as you eat the ramen, which is part of the part of the appeal of ramen, but it does change. And Skamen is kind of fun because, you know, if you make a really tasty noodle, the right, just the same thing with us with a morisoba. Right, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're eating this noodle, and as you're chewing it, you know, you're getting little, little puffs of wheat flavor or whatever. Maybe you folded in some corn, toasted corn flour into it, or whatever you did to make that particular noodle, and you get this great experience of, you know, I love noodles. I mean, I love any noodle. I like rice noodles. I like wheat noodles. I like, you know, cognac noodles. I mean, I like noodles. I mean, I, I think they're. I love the shape of them. I love the way they eat. I love the way they chew. I mean, I just. I'm in love with noodles. I'm probably more in love with noodles than I am with soup. I, I just. Noodles are so fun. And, uh, and so, you know, that's why, I, you know, I always really like the Mazinet style too, because, you know, you, you get people to really get into like this whole experience of chewing and slurping. And, and I think it, it, in a hot bowl of noodles, it's, it, it, it changes very quickly, you know, and, and I'm sure you guys, me, you know, Japanese dudes, you know, I'll, I, I can crush a bowl in a couple of minutes and it's empty, but most people don't. So, you know, the longer they eat it, the more it starts, it's like, it's like if you, if you try to explain to someone, if you made a sandwich with lots of mayo on it, but then you left it and you tried to eat it in 20 minutes, right? It'd be fucking gross. It'd be all like wet. You know, who wants to eat a wet sandwich? And, you know, old ramen is kind of the same. You know, the noodles are kind of, they're kind of soft. And then the, and the broth kind of takes on the flour flavor. And the whole thing kind of changes. So it's, it's, you know, I mean, that's really why you're supposed to eat ramen so fast. It's the same thing with pizza, right? I mean, it's not, pizza's not supposed to sit on the table for an hour. You're supposed to eat it fast. And if you burn yourself, you know, too bad. <laughs> have you been forced to make any changes as far as like the, the ramen that you're serving in America? Like you have this idea of what you want to serve. Have you been forced to like make any concessions in that, in that regard? You know, no, really, I really haven't. I really have. Yes. One, yes. One, but the only concession I've had to make is I have to suffer through watching people eat ramen for an hour. <laughs> That's, that's the only, that's the only thing. Like I said, in my old shop in Tokyo, I would, I would yell at people mm. and say, you're eating too slow or, you know, or a guy would go out on the phone would ring and he'd be out there and I, and I, his ramen would be ready. And I would go outside and I'd say, yo, your ramen's ready. He'd be like, yeah, I'm on the phone. And I was like, get the fuck off the phone or I'm throwing in the garbage. Don't come back. You don't have to pay, you know? And, and you could be that way. And I mean, it's sort of shtick and it was real shtick in Japan to be that way, but in a way, it's like, you know, and that's very Japan too, right? That, you know, if you go to a shop and you don't eat properly, you're not really welcome back. And that's true. If you go to a ramen shop, the guy recognizes you and you only eat half your food and you act like a putz. When you come back, he'll go, he'll go, you know, no, no, you know, you run along. 
and it, it happens. And, and so it's, it's, it's like, there's a certain amount of respect in Japan that I like, you know, it's like, hey, if you're gonna go eat yakitori, you eat yakitori like this, not like that. And if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna do, you know, you know, if you're gonna eat sushi, you don't like dump your rice into the soy sauce and mush it all around. And like, you know, it, it's it's gross and it turns people off and it makes people uncomfortable. So don't do that or don't eat or don't eat sushi. And so you know, ramen's the same. It's like, uh, you know, people are lined up outside. You you eat your bowl as fast as you can. You leave. And if you're with friends, you say to your friends, hey. Outside, and eat. You, know, you come with me when you're ready, and and it's you know you know these are things about Japanese culture that I really love, and you know I love America and I love American culture. There's a lot of things I like, but sometimes you know I'm disappointed how Americans they're like, well, it's my table. I'm like, well, well yes, no one's going to argue that you spent money and it's your table, and no one's going to think you're a bad person. But if you know the restaurant's super busy and you've noticed all these hungry people waiting outside. Maybe you could continue your conversation at a nearby bar or a coffee shop rather than being selfish and sitting at the table for two hours when you don't need to be there that long. And I always liked that about Japan. It's like, you know, it's just a little thing, but it's thinking about how people feel. And um, in that respect, Japan has changed me a lot. I mean, I really think that I spend much more time thinking about how people feel and how my behavior might make them feel better. So do you consider your ramen like Japanese ramen, American ramen, or does ramen transcend these kind of cultural identities? Like where well, that's does a great, it sit? That's a great question, isn't it? You know, of course, in my eye, my mind, it's ramen, because I don't Yeah, think. I've had people say it's very Western tasting, and I'm like, okay, I mean, I don't know what that means, really, because I don't really have a way to compare it. I mean, I, I you know, in my mind, I mean, I've, I really like my ramen. So earlier, right, we talked about making food that you like and that you pitch to people. So I make ramen that I like to eat the most. So if, if I were to say, like, I, I almost never eat anybody else's ramen anywhere that I eat and go, oh, shit, damn, that's so much better than mine. I got to eat that. I mean, I just never feel that way. And once again, it's not an ego thing. And I'm not saying it's because I think I'm better or smarter or I'm a better chef. I, I just think I make ramen that I really, really, really like. And I make it like super fine tuned to my palate. So I love my ramen. Having said that, there are lots of ramen shops that I love and I dream about going back to and I can't wait to go back to Tokyo and there's, there's always a list of shops I hit and, and when I eat those ramen, they're, they're, they're very different than mine and I really like them. But I don't really know. I, just, I guess I just think I make, I make Ivan ramen. It's, it is what it is. You know, we, we talked earlier about, you know, the fact that there are so many different kinds of ramen. So you could say, well, when I'm in the mood, I go eat Ivan ramen. I really love it. When I'm in the mood, I go to Nakamura, then I all go to Minka, and I go to, you know, whatever. I go to that place. And boy, those places, I really like those places. You know, you don't, you don't need to say, Ivan oh, ramen is the only good ramen. That's, you know, it's, it's why, why, why do you have to, it's just not necessary. There's so many great places to go eat food. And ramen is so fun. It's such an interesting food. It's just like, it, it can be, it can taste different from shop to shop and yet be super satisfying. Mm -hmm. I think it's such an interesting point too, because ramen is so versatile in the way that it exists. You know, mm -hmm. Ivan ramen is so stylistically different from Nakamura's restaurant, which is different from Minka, but they are all clearly ramen, right? They all exist oh, yeah. in space. So Absolutely. It's definitely a, a fair point. But like, I think the thing that a lot of the people who listen to this podcast wonder about, and I certainly wonder about this too, is like, what is American ramen then? Like, does it exist? Is that a thing? Like, what's the difference between it versus Japanese ramen in your mind? Well, so, you know, it's a great question. It really is. And I think, so I think personally that in 10 or 15 years, there will be ramen in America that is every bit as good as any ramen in Japan. I really do. And I think that, I think that I, I this is, this is, I really feel strong. There is only one kind of good ramen. There is only one kind. It's where the broth and the noodles and the garnishes are harmonious with each other and they all work together. And when you eat them, you're just slurping and chewing and drinking and you're like, ah, this is great. And it all works and it all marries. And, and I think if you do that successfully, it doesn't matter. There doesn't have to be an American ramen. I mean, I've been making wacky ramen for fucking years. I've made Mexican ramen. I've made bacon, lettuce, and tomato ramen. I've made, you know, I used to do, I used to make my own uh, ume vinegar. And, I, and then I would blend it with, uh, 
with uh, dashi and I would do that as my uh, hiyashi chuka. And, you know, I, I mean, I've done all kinds of things. And then, you know, in the very beginning, when I first started this business, you know, I, I, would, I would go, I went to Ajito. Have you ever heard of Ajito? It, uh, it's a place, it's in Shinagawaku. And the guy, he, he also opened either shortly before or shortly after I opened. But I went. So you have to remember, when I first started this business, I was scared because of this question you're asking. Like, is your ramen Western? Is it Ivan? Is it Japanese? Is it American? What is it? And, and I, I didn't know how far as a chef I should push the envelope in cooking. I mean, I can cook anything. You know, I mean, I can try to cook anything, right? I mean, right? And cooking is cooking. In my mind, cooking is cooking. There is no cooking you can't do. Once you know how to cook, you cook. You know, oh, I don't have that technique. You learn the technique. You know, you need a tool, you get the tool. But it's but cooking is cooking. It, it's 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 that. How much would Japanese people accept me? And if I went too far and I made a peanut butter and jelly ramen, even if it was delicious, people might be like, you know what? I just can't. I can't accept peanut butter. Take and some jelly notes ramen. on that peanut butter and jelly <laughs> yeah. ramen. Right. Get that you know going. what? And I, it might not be bad. You never know. <laughs> yeah, but, you, but, honestly. Yeah, so I went to uh, I went to this Ajito place, and this guy was doing a mazeman style, and it was an anchovy pizza mazeman, and it tasted exactly like an anchovy pizza, but wow. it tasted really good, and it totally worked as a mazeman. It's it slurped. It, that's the other thing that that I think that ramen has. Ramen has to slurp. Like sometimes you'll try to slurp a bad bowl, and the noodles are dry, and you're. <laughs> You're sucking as hard as you can. It won't even get into your mouth. And I mean, I just, I just hate those balls because, you know, you can't slurp. You have to be able to slurp. But anyway, it slurped. It was delicious. It was ramen. You know, then I went to, uh, um, um, what was that place called? The place where they do the, at, at Bossa Nova. And they did a green Thai curry ramen. And I was yeah. like, wow, man. I was like, it was like mind blowing because I was like, wait, this is totally ramen. It has total katsuobushi flavor, like kind of forward flavor. It slurps. It's unctuous. It's so delicious. And yet it's like Thai. And so I was like, wow, this is fucking wow. Okay. So maybe I can do this ramen thing. Maybe it's okay. Maybe I can, maybe I can be myself and make my food as long as it slurps, as long as it's harmonious, as long as it's serious, as long as it's flavorful, as long as I do those things, people will give me an opportunity and come to my restaurant. And, you know, I knew I was a white dude, you know, that was my hook. I'm a white guy. I'm opening this ramen shop in Tokyo. People were going to want to kind of see what it's all about. But I also know, knew that, you know, if people didn't like the food, they wouldn't come back. And I had lots of regulars who came all the time and, and, you know, we were busy. So it, it was, it was a, it was a, it was a tough thing to try to figure out. So I, I think at the end of the day, and keep coming back to this idea that the, the beauty of ramen and why probably all three of us like it so much is that there's so many opportunities to make different types and do different things that you don't have to be pigeonholed into tonkotsu style or, or, or a double soup style. You can make many different styles and if they're good and delicious and they work and they make sense, then people will eat them and they'll enjoy them. And, and so I think that I've already had plenty of really good ramen made in America that, you know, that's like, wow, that's fucking great. My God, that's really good bowl of ramen. So it's, it's, you know, I think you have to get away from this attitude, this idea that, you know, like only a Japanese guy can make ramen or you have to be in Tokyo to make ramen. It's not. I think you have to understand, you have to understand the spirit of ramen. And I think there's a spirit of ramen. Once you understand the spirit of ramen, then I think you can make a really good bowl of ramen. Now you might not be a great cook, so you may never make a really great bowl. <laughs> But I do think that you have to understand the spirit of it. And I've had really bad bowls where I'm like, you know, you didn't take the time to figure out like what, what is ramen? Like and how should it eat? And, you know, I, I feel this way. So I'm a chef 30 something years now. I mean, I graduated culinary school in 93. And so, you know, I've been cooking a really long time. I don't know if, I don't know how long that is. Maybe it's, maybe it's not 30 years, maybe it's 27 years. Anyway, I've been cooking, I've been cooking long enough. And, I think it's very important to understand how food eats. So you can make a delicious bowl of food that tastes really good, good, but if everything in the bowl is round and tiny and it won't stay on your fork, and every time you try to bring it up to your mouth, it falls back into the bowl, and ultimately you have to kind of shovel it in, and it's a horrible experience, that's not a good plate of food, even if it tastes good. 
It's just not a good plate of food. If you make a sandwich that you can't really hold and it, and it tears apart in your hands and it disintegrates, it's just not a good sandwich because mm -hmm. you have to be able to eat the food that you've made for someone. And so I think that's a really important thing to think about in ramen. It's, it's, it has to eat right. And good food eats well. Any kind of food, doesn't matter what it is. It's all food, if it's good, it eats well. So that when, because remember, eating is, is experiential. It's not just, hey, I made a bowl of ramen, it's badass. It's like, well, I know, but I, but I can't fucking eat it. I can't, it keeps falling off the, the chopsticks and it, it doesn't stick to the soup or something or the, the chashu like melted apart. I can't eat it or I don't know, whatever it is. But I just think that, you know, food needs to eat well and, and it's, it's as important with ramen as it is with risotto or anything you know it needs to eat right and uh sometimes i i've eaten food ramen too where i'm like you know i i just feel like the person didn't put enough thought into the customer's experience because at the end of the day at least for me my goal is to have you be really happy and have you say boy this was really fun you might even say you know it's not my best bowl that place across town's better i like that place better but boy this was really fun and the staff was so sweet and the music was great and I, well, this was fun. You know I mean? That's cause that's what we do when we cook for people. We, we, you know, our goal is to, is to not put our dicks on the table, but to, to you know, make people happy. So I've had a few you know, Japanese chefs, uh, ramen chefs on this show too. And they've all kind of said the same thing where as far as flavor wise, there really is no hard rules for ramen. It's just more being thoughtful about how you're crafting the dish. And you know, if you're making something that, everything works together, like you're saying, harmoniously, then it really doesn't matter what flavors you're actually using, as long as you're thoughtful and you have an idea of what you want to create. And, and it needs to make sense. Food needs yeah, to yeah. make sense. You know, if you mix, you know, pineapple, guava, and, and you know, tortilla chips, or I don't know, you, know, you might be like, I, I, I'm sorry, I just didn't get it. I didn't get, you know, mm -hmm. the flavors didn't really work or the textures didn't really work or, you know, you know, food needs to make sense. You need to be able to look at it. It needs to make sense and you eat it and say, I, I understand what it is you're trying. I mean, unless you're like Grant Atkins or something and he's a genius and he doesn't, right. you know, it, it's different, you know, but, but he's at the very, 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 very top. So there's a few guys out there who are so so brilliant and so talented that they can break rules all the time and, and get away with it. But for most of us normal people, you know, you, you, it, it's hard to break the rules to that degree. And so you, you need to give people boundaries so that they can understand what it is you're trying to say to them and it makes sense, you know? And, and, uh, and so that's what I try to do and try to not go too far out there because then people, you know, you know, remember most people don't, don't know how food is made the same way if, someone took you to their advertising agency, you'd look around and be like, yeah, I still don't really know what you guys do. And, you know, believe it or not, you know, food is the same. Even though people all, you know, eat it and they have it in their homes, they don't really understand how it's made and they don't really understand the amount of effort it takes to get it to them. And they don't understand all the, all the little obstacles there are to successfully run of a, a restaurant. And, and they just know that they're sitting there and someone hands them something and they're going to and so it's our jobs to, to make it as easy as possible for them to enjoy themselves. And, and as soon as you start putting up obstacles of, you know, oh, you no, no, you have to eat it this way, or you have to use these special chopsticks. They're really hard to hold, but it's, you know, whatever it is, you know, it just, it makes it, the harder you make it for someone to understand what you're trying to tell to them, the harder it is for them to have a good time. So I mean, to me, my goal has always been to try to simplify things for people to enjoy themselves. And remember, people, people have difficult lives, man. I and mean, they really do. They got all kinds of stuff going on. And they come to, they come to my restaurant to, to try to take a load off. And so I, I try to help them do that. Wow. Well, Ivan, this has been great. I don't want to take up too much more of your time because you've already gone over an hour with us. But as far as like if you want to – tell the people in the ramen community like what they should be doing now. Like, it's been a hard time for a lot of ramen restaurants and a lot of people out there. If you want to direct their attention anywhere, it's something that they could do if you want to do that. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, listen, uh, yeah, I'll tell you what I'll tell them when it's, when it's July and August and New York finally lets us ramen shops and restaurants reopen, push yourself to go eat a nice hot bowl of ramen, even though it's 97 degrees outside because you know, July and August are, are, hardest months mm. for good reason. You know, most people don't really want to sit over a steaming hot bowl when it's hot outside. I mean, I've been a ramen nut my, for many years. So, I mean, I'll eat a steaming hot bowl of ramen when it's a hundred degrees and I don't care, you know, but, <laughs> but, but not, but not everybody is like that, but it's, uh, 
it's going to be really hard. So hopefully people will start to come out again. You know, ramen delivery has been very challenging. Uh, you know, we, we've been doing it for many years. So at least we're kind of good at it. And we, we already have a system. And, you know, there's all these algorithms that help you sell and stuff. But if you haven't been doing it for a certain amount of time, you're kind of at the bottom of the pile. So it's, it's just been really hard for restaurant ramen shops to decide to do, you know, uh, delivery out of nowhere. And then it's, just, you know, it's very difficult to make any money. So I guess we're all just going to have to cool our heels. I mean, um, I'm willing to suck it up until the, the country's a little bit safer. I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure if, uh, you know, social distancing and staying at home is the, the absolute right way, but it seems to be the only option we have at the moment. And I think we all just have to be brave and try to wait a little bit longer. And uh, I'm working on lots of ideas to try to make it worth everybody's while once we reopen. And, and hopefully we'll all just get back to it. And, and then hopefully, you know, you guys will tell your kids about the terrible pandemic of 2020. <laughs> Speaking of kids, you really give me hope for my kid because he has a lot of uh, disrespect for authority. <laughs> it's like you. Oh, you yeah. Know, like How old is your kid? He's, he's six, and so he's already starting the, uh, it seems a little early, but I love him to death, but yeah, he's yeah, going to be a future Ivan Arkin, hopefully. Well, I've had, I have three of them, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of work, but you know what, they're, they're my treasure, and uh, it's, you know, uh, for me, and, and you know, having kids isn't for everybody, but it, it does, it does give you purpose when you try to push yourself that you have, but uh, you have some guys and girls that you want to, you know, take care of and create a special world for. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, I think it's super worthwhile. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Ivan. I really do appreciate no, and, it. And, and thanks for, you know, it was very yeah, nice you guys been, to, so nice you guys to really bid great. and do that whole thing. And, you know, like I said, I would have done it anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> thanks I so will. much, Ivan. All right. Well, all right, guys, take it slow. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>